What's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. If you know me, I'm sure you know my buddy Elias here. Um, got him on for another podcast. He's always good. I know if he's got the day off or a weather day, I'll usually text him like, hey, you want to try to do the podcast? And it worked out today. Um, but we're going to talk about near shore uh, fishing this time of year, kind of what Elias goes through, what he, what he likes to do, we'll get away from the crowd sometimes a little bit. Um, but there's a lot of options. Uh, in the ocean this time of year, and especially right now this year, like it seems like there's a, kind of a good bit going on. So we're going to talk about, you know, what you can do near the beach. But uh, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you, returning champion. Returning champion. Um, it's uh, it's good to have you back. Well, um, if you haven't before we get going, if you haven't checked out Elias's channel, he's local here in Wilmington and uh, great kayak fisherman, great fisherman. So go check out Elias V Fishing. Five years. Um, Five years on YouTube now? No, five years in Wilmington now. Oh, five years in Wilmington now. Golly, that's crazy. Five year five. Um, and how many how many years have you been doing YouTube? Uh, probably seven. Seven years. So uh, seven or eight. Yeah. Seven or eight years. Nice. Um, well, cool. Yeah, Wilmington. Your majority. Your, uh, my content is definitely Carolina based now. Yeah, for sure. Far vast majority by far. Yeah, and you started up in where did you start? I started in New York. In New York. Okay. Um, moved here in two thousand seventeen. End of two thousand seventeen. Yeah. And you travel a little bit each year. I do like to travel. I love yeah. travel, especially in the summertime. Yeah. Um, my summer fishing I enjoy the most is bridges. Yeah. Bridges are hot in the summer. Yeah. And doing off the beach stuff. For sure. The two hot, the hot spots. Yeah. So you have to tell me anywhere to go fish in the, in, the, in the country this time of year. I'd say let's go hit the ocean along the beaches with the kayaks. Yeah. And let's take the kayaks on the biggest, baddest bridges we got. Yeah. What do you think it is? Do you think it's that that deeper water, that heavy structure that those fish kind of relate to in the summer? Um, most of your fish at that point, no matter where you are in the country, um, I think every big bridge, let's start with the bridge first. Um, yeah. Every big bridge um, will have every species that is local to the, the ecosystem, yeah. probably around it at that point in the summertime. So everything that migrates is there. All your local fish should be there. Um, so you have the maximized opportunity to catch right, right. most amounts of fish um, up north here. And then uh, doing the beach thing is a lot of fun. Uh, you have a lot of different fish to target along the beachfront. Um, primarily here in the Carolinas, we have um, the mackerels, we've got sharks. Got the sharks. <laughs> we've got plenty of sharks. Um, you have drum. Sporadically, but you can yeah. get drum. You, have, you might have some drum opportunities. Um, we can talk a little bit about the bottom fish that can pop in, and of course, then you got any other. You you call them your, your lightning round fish. Any of the random variables from right. anywhere right. from Florida that can show up at a moment's notice. For sure. In small numbers and big numbers, it just you, you know. Yeah. Um, so f summer's fun, and you, there's always like. Every year, there's something that blindsides me out in the ocean doing that summer fishing um, uh, along the beach, either whether it be on the bait pods or just some blasting through randomly uh, from false albacore showing up on a random August day that you, yeah. <laughs> you really didn't prepare for. Um, it's a lot of fun. It keeps you on the toes. On a, you know, we'll talk about what's more reliable yeah. than just yeah, yeah. things to and what to be ready for. <laughs> you know, just things that you know maybe this is going to work. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a good time. I, I like the, those. Are, that's what I would spend all of my time doing for uh, July, August, and most of September. Bridges yeah. inshore, and if I'm not at inshore bridge fishing, I'd be on the ocean side. Yeah, and that's it. I, I I'm always so jealous of Elias. Like he's like, oh, have you done this lately? I'm like, well, I can't do that because I ninety <laughs> percent of what he does is very hard to. It's hard to teach clients in four hours. You know what I mean? Like how to. Some stuff is a little more straightforward, but a lot of that, like bot, like bottom super jigs and stuff like that, fishing crab, um, sheep's head fishing, like it just gets tough to, to convert someone. In. I mean, if someone's got, if someone's fishy, they can pick it up pretty quick. But if it's like someone that's just like a tourist trip or something like that, it's really hard to, like you got almost just fish a Carolina rig, you know, throw it out there and they'd be like, all right, just hold on to this and don't do anything, and I'll just reel when I tell you to. So unfortunately, and, I, and I'm not saying that to be negative, it's just like you want to be you want your clients to be successful and so you're trying to put them in like the highest percentage easiest way to catch fish but um so take me through what a day in the summer would look like for you like if you started out right. the, the weather was nice yeah, let's, let's go there through. was going to be no boat traffic 
So let's pretend there is going to okay, be. Okay, all right, there's going to be. Let's be right. realistic. Oh, let's be realistic. You're right. All right, so I'll just give you like an ideal, you know, ocean day. Um, weather's great in the morning, and then a typical south kick up by lunchtime. Yeah. It's a pretty typical day almost everywhere I've fished, you know, yeah. when you get that nice summer day. Um, I'd say for the most part, uh, the best strategy is uh, having that sunrise launch getting started right at sunrise, yeah. as soon as you basically have enough safe light to get out there. Um, I usually like to start by, I mean, I've got two strategies that I like to use in the summertime. Um, you can either take the option and blast straight out to structure, or you can spend an, I usually say there's like a hour or two along the beach. Mm -hmm. With flounder being closed, and if I'm, in it for the day for the meat, um, typically what I would do is sit on the beach and just cruise slowly, um, try to probably have a couple of different things ready. Uh, numero uno, uh, the number one target for summer fishing is Spanish mackerel. Yeah, say. yeah. I would say, at least for artificials, right? Um, so I'll have something, I tend to like thin profiles for Spanish mm -hmm. casting range, uh, one ounce stuff. This is for a moment's notice. Cruising down the beach, bam, start in front of you, porpoising, jumping, chasing bait, um, have something to blast at them instantly. Um, if you're good at doing that sort of, it's tight opportunity, those yeah. Spanish mackerel in the summer. It's very tight, but you can probably, if you're if you're good and refined at it, um, you can probably get close to 100% conversion rates. Yeah. If you see one Spanish flip and two, and if you have your timing down to the T, it's always... Um, that's why that preparation is key. If you have all your, your rod organized, your lures ready to go, there's no yeah. like, there's not much playtime with that. You can't stuff. be like, oh, some Spanish. I'm gonna tie a epoxy jig on. Yeah, or yeah something. everything has to be ready to yeah. go for that. Um, and taking advantage of just those fish, it's not rocket science to retrieve, cast, hold the rod low to the water, retrieve quickly, and you know you'll either hook up, and if this is typical Spanish macro behavior in the summer. Um, you'll get a couple quick jumps and right. you, you, you connect it, you got your one fish, um, and then rinse and repeat. This can take, sometimes um, it'll take, uh, you know, maybe 10 minutes for these fish to, to show themselves again. Mm -hmm. Ideally, my favorite scenario is if I found a pot of bait. Yeah. Uh, whether it be the pogies, the bonker, uh, threadfin herring, later in the summer they'll be on the back of the brakes on the mullet schools so any kind of stuff that i can kind of always keep a visual eye on right so right. i know you know is this something that's likely to repeat my success for the rest of this morning or trip um when you're fishing these giant bait pods uh you get a lot more variables as opposed to just having a couple of spanish flipping in front of you chasing the smaller baits your other option is, let's say, before we get back, dive deep into the, the way I like to fish bait pods from the kayak. Um, so you catch your, your Spanish with your with them porpoising around. Um, you know, the bite, you catch one or two. The bite never, you know, you don't see another sign of them. Um, your options are to continue to troll the beachfront, mm. look for more fish. Um, some people, I don't have much luck of just sitting there and hoping they're going to come back to my same area. But you can just drift there and... You know, yeah. if you don't have the means to cover the ground, sometimes it goes into my head is I should be moving and looking for, you know, a different area and see if those fish are moving along. What were they following? What do they, you know, is there anything I can pattern into this? Right, this right. is a very random fish we're dealing with. Yeah. It's not, here is not a rock there. This is yeah. the, the stressfulness of how sporadic it can, it is. Almost as random as the albacore. Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely in that, in that range. So you can try to hedge your bets. Um, do some trolling. Uh, if this is a weird subject because there's plenty of information about trolling lures from a boat for Spanish mackerel and king mackerel. Mm -hmm. The kayak, the biggest thing that's different than a boat is your maximum speed to consistently go is going to be probably like three or four miles an hour tops. Right. While the boat speed is typically like six or seven. Right. Correct right. right. me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times you just go as fast as you need to to get out of the lizard fish. There's a lot of times what it is. <laughs> right. And, and then your sense. bites convert from lizard fish to, to Spanish. Um, so the kayak has got that, that extra variable. So certain lures won't work as well. So a lot of the Spanish mackerel lures that guys use from the boats were built for boats. They just don't perform as well 
when you're going on that three to four mile an hour range. Right. So, um, the client, a lot of the guys I've learned Spanish macro kayak fishing from, uh, they prefer the Rapala XR10s. Mm-hmm. It yeah. seems to be, they're good. Yeah. They're good. Um, I slowly have figured, or not, I wouldn't say figured, I've grown a preference for something that has a little bit more of a, a narrower lip versus that kind of that wider curved okay. lip that the XR10, the Rapala has. The um, narrower or the tighter the wobble, right? Like it's it a little bit of a tighter, tighter swim yeah. versus like that bigger. I find that that um, tighter swim, like I think they're more kind of like a traditional jerk bait. Yeah, yeah. Um, that tighter action seems to, I don't know if it, it just works better at those slower speeds or just maybe that macro family likes it better. So I used the, last year I started using those live targets. Uh-huh. Work great. Like, and I did like a few days of experimenting uh, XR10 in this rod holder and live target in the other rod holder, and it was like five to one. Well, are you fishing that live target with the multiple little bait fish paint on it? Did yeah, you send me some pictures of that? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if these multiple bait fish makes a difference yeah. versus the, la- the, the way the actual plug yeah, yeah, yeah. swims. And I think that lip on those, um, Yozuri, and I, I think it's Yozuri also makes some inshore plugs that are, I think they might just be large amount bass plugs, honestly. Yeah. That have that tighter lip. I think Mega Bass. Probably, I wouldn't fish a Mega Bass. For, Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of the. You'll probably find them more in like the jerk bait um, right. I, uh, section of, of the hard baits, and I, I have better rate um, luck with those from the kayak from that particular speed. Uh, I've never messed with Clark spoons. I've kind of looked at it. I want to keep what's practical from the kayak. Right, right. Uh, practic- being practical is as important as it is. So like. Showing up with a live well full of bait sometimes is, it's almost impossible. First of all, if you got any surf to go through, forget it. You got all that water and the weight back there, you'll never make it. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Number two is um, uh, all that weight back there. It's going to slow you down. Yeah. So like you know, if you have a you know, full fifty quart, uh, fifty gallon um, cooler full of water, you know, you know, like a lot of these things will affect the performance of this kayak. So if you're going to try to do this uh, cruising down the beachfront stuff and you want to do a 10-mile day, uh, you're going to have to manage your weight properly on that kayak, you know, no drinking the night before. There's a lot of things that got to go into this. Um, (laughs) So the more more practical the lure is and the more practical the approach is, the better. Um, The other thing that works pretty well, I don't find it to work as well in the summertime sometimes. Um, I've had luck with those daisy chains. Yeah. The blue water candy ones, they're mm-hmm. just like those little squids. Because um, you can keep those up high at a pretty slow speed. Yeah, they stay up high pretty well. Um, they're pretty practical. They're definitely a good war of attrition type of lore. Yeah. They'll catch tons of Spanish as well. They're, they're good at doing that. Um, and, you know, they make some of the bigger, bigger profiles. And I'm not as crazy about those at trying to troll them at three to four miles an hour, like the Daiwa SP Minnow, the Yozuri. It's not the crystal minnow; it's a different one. But like the three DS, it's, big, it's another one, one of those yeah. giant ones. I seem to have better luck with just generally the smaller profiles okay. that, that swim real tight and are, you know, kind of sleek and slender looking, um, from Spanish to size to the real like six, seven, eight pound fish. They when you're fishing those baits from the kayak, you know, traditionally you think about like a live bait rig. You're fishing a really loose drag. So yes. you don't pull those troubles out. Are you fishing a pretty loose drag on those those lures when you're trolling? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Right. Yeah, you, it's um, it's very easy to lose those fish. Yeah. They have soft mouths. Um, they swim real fast. They'll take really fast runs, and you can pull those hooks instantly with that. Um, I also, you know, it's fun too. Those jerk baits too. If you're um, you've seen those fish bust, and you're only have like one or two rods with you, you know, you can just switch it up instantly and bomb it at yeah, him yeah. as opposed to trying to troll through him. Right. And you see those fish that they're crumb coming up on those bait pods, and you have an opportunity to cast. Same thing, you're trolling. You can just bomb it right in front of you and get it. Right. You know, maximize your opportunity to that. That happens plenty. For sure. Today. Like maybe I'll have two of these trolling plugs ready to go. Maybe one's going to get bit off. You know, sometimes this, these windows of opportunity to catch a fish can be narrow. Um, you know, you can have a second one ready. You can literally just pause your troll with the kayak and it's like, all right, the fish there. Grab right. the other one. And right. try to, you know, it, it could get a little chaotic, but you can definitely maximize your opportunity like that. Um, so that's, you know, your, your cruising method, I guess, to cruise up and down the beach, get those Spanish. Um, if you do a full morning's worth, I'd say somewhere to about 8, 8.30, 9 a.m., 
Um, as soon as you know you need to really put your sunglasses on, and the minute you take your sunglasses off, it's starting to hurt your head, your right. face. <laughs> that Spanish that that hot bite might be over is usually what I expect uh, in that in that summer month in those summer months, uh, especially when there's no bait around. Right. And that's I'd say five days a week there'll be no bait around here. Just what my experience is, maybe one or two days there'll be bait on the beach. That's kind of my yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's it's funny too. It's like you're rewarded this time of year for for starting early. You know, yeah, like for sure. there's so much that happens in that first hour of light during the day before there's boats running over top of everything. Whether you're inshore or near shore, um, you know that bite is definitely it's worth that early start if you can get away with it. And that. you'll you'll really know what to do real quickly after that too. Like you'll know if you should by like seven o'clock. I'll know. If there was no bite on the beach, I'll know if I should just go straight out and bottom fish somewhere. Or if I know maybe I should stay another hour or two. We have enough yeah. activity on the beach that, you know, maybe this will stick, you know, hang on till 9 a.m. And as you get into fall, the bite changes completely. Like that can go, you know, early morning and, you know, dips and come back and, you know, you'll have a little bit more waves. And that seems like in the summer when that mackerel bite's good. And to me, from a kayak, I mean, if I catch five decent size, that's a good yeah, good morning. Yeah. That's what I would say is my, my expectation sure. of a good Spanish mackerel morning. Yeah. I would say five is good. You know, uh, two or three is kind of average. Um, if I only get like one and I missed a couple, that could be more user error. And then some mornings I see none of this activity. Right, right. Um, when you get the, you, you, you hit jackpot and you found some late big pods in the morning that are, you know, corralled up and, you know, pelicans diving, nobody's on them. Um, Spanish records, in my opinion, tend to be always on the outskirts of these schools. Yeah. If I have to draw a piece of paper right now, we could draw the big school bait. Um, you'll have your, your mackerels on the side and any other fork tail, real quick sw- swimmers, Jack Cravals, you yeah. know, your random king mackerel. Um, and then underneath all this bait is typically you're in shark land <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> you hope it's cobia land, but it never is. It's, it's shark land. So underneath <laughs> it's just loaded with sharks. Um, and you can do this probably two ways. I still think even when you have those pokey pods around you, uh, or even those fat baits, I still find the smaller, thinner metals. Yeah. The Spanish will still like them. Even if they're, they're clipping off bait from these, um, from these schools, they still, you know, I wouldn't really even consider switching the profile a whole lot of the time. It seems like they just like that, that shape more. Um, but it doesn't mean it wouldn't work. Like you can, you can love like a regular casting spoon right, and hook right. up. But I'd say if, you know, that's what you tied on from your, you know, if I tied that on from my surf launch, I'll probably still throw that and, you know, have yeah. decent success with it. Um, this is when your live bait rigs come into play. Um, if you're a beginner or you're just not sure about it, just grab those blue water candy, double treble rigs. They'll do just fine yeah. for, for the Spanish mackerel what you need. And, um, how I do it is I just take a little Ziploc bag, I label it my king mackerel and Spanish thing, and it's got like five king mackerel rigs in it, or Spanish mackerel rigs, um, and I put two of the, the snatch rigs, snagging rigs. Yeah. Um, I tie those with just number four trebles, it's tiny and the weakest, thinnest wire that they are, that they, you know, the hook I could find. Mm-hmm. Like a one ounce sinker and do, make my little snatch rig and cast and try to snag a couple of these pogies. Uh, it's up to you. There is no standard in the market of kayak fishing of how to keep your baits alive <laughs> when you're out in the ocean. Um, some guys use bait buckets. Some guys have built tubes. I've seen mesh nets. I've seen live wells. Uh, in general, all these methods I've tried, I've never been able to keep more than three pogies alive. Really? Three is my max. Oh, gosh. That's what I've learned. you got to make it count. I'm sitting there with just pitching baits off the side of my boat. Yeah, you, sorry, tr- in terms of transport. Like, if you can, you find a school of bait that has your, your, your fish that you want to catch near them, try to stay on them as long as possible right. without them. You know, you, they'll probably be moving down the beach. But try, you know, hopefully they're big enough. You can always keep a visual while you're hooked up. If the shark's dragging you away from the school... I'm turning my head the whole time that I don't lose sight of where that's cool. We were right? that, you know, if I finally hook the shark and I'm dealing with it, I want to make sure I, if the, especially if the birds aren't doing it away, I want to stay and try to keep as close to that. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm multitasking. Like I know I have the, the fish I don't want on the line. Right, right. 
Um, but yeah, that's definitely an important strategy is to not lose your baits because some days it's just that one or two pods of bait and that's okay. what you found and you know that that'll make it happen for you too. Um, oh, we're talking about the pogies. Uh, in addition to the, the all the red drum I've seen here have not been on the bottom when they're on the pogies. Yeah. A lot of the times I'll see the tail in the middle of that pogey school um, versus on the bottom. It's like a Labrador retriever. They're like just all up. Something's in the middle, like on the side of it, you just see a big tail and that's been the red drum. And I've seen that. Um, if you're patterned into it, you can do use the, you just use a popping cork and, you know, a paddle tail lure. Yeah. I've had that work before. Uh, in those schools of pogies, definitely has worked. Um, it'll just draw them off of it. Uh, they're so curious, man, those big yeah, red fish. Yeah, and I think that whenever those big schools of bait are around, they don't necessarily become as bottom-oriented. Right. So they'll change their behavior. I think if you were just randomly cruising down the beach and there's fish actively working through the beach, they'll always be on the bottom. But then if you get something that draws them off the bottom, they'll start to act funky. And, you know, I think they could just use that huge pot of bait as their shelter. Yeah, that's For the most there. part. Yeah, it's their structure, basically, yeah. now. The fish just want to orient to something, it seems yeah. like, whether it's bait or whether it's structure or yeah, for sure. a zone in the, you know, in the, on, on the beach. But. Um, so, you know, you can, the way I like to fish, so let's say I've got a couple of my baits off the school and I rig them up on the, I use a conventional, you know, yeah. a conventional reel. Um, I like to just kind of slowly cruise or troll around the edge of the school. I don't want to be trolling no weights. The minute you put a weight down, I tried this a bunch of times for this Miracle Cub, yeah, it's instant shark. You drop anything uh, five feet down, instant shark. Yeah. Um, it seems like the speed that to, to move my live baits is around two to three miles an hour. If I go a little bit slower, shark. You know, and if I start going too fast, a lot of these baits, I'll start killing them yeah. a lot of the time. Um, same deal, super loose drag. When those Spanish are on the feed on the actual schools, they'll smoke these baits very quickly. Yeah. The minute you start putting them out behind the kayak, and they'll come up and crush them pretty quickly. Yeah. It's, it doesn't take much time. Um, the, the only gamble here is now is, uh, do you take your baits further off the beach, or do you stick with the, the school of bait, even when the school of bait has shown that the signs of you know your fish catching might have burnt out. You know, right. A lot of times right. I'll start on a school of bait in the morning, and I'll start catching my Spanish real quickly. And then um, that 8 a.m. call, and I'm catching out of sharks. Yeah. Stop catching anything besides sharks. Right. And it's like, whoa, what do I do here? Do I sit with this bait or do I, you know, try to gamble it and take my three right. <laughs> <laughs> off the beach? Sometimes the gamble works out. Um, uh, other times it's, it's, it's a very um, tough decision, angling decision to make because you're probably done for the day. Yeah. On terms of having your bait opportunities, but that's a typical thing to uh, happen during the summer months. That is that you'll you'll get that two hour window to make all these really crucial decisions fishing wise, uh, and to make it happen at least on your 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 fork tail critters. Right. Um, it just happens real quick in the summer, and that's uh, pretty typical. I mean, in terms of what's you know off the beach. Um, where we live, it's loaded with um, just random scattered structure, one mile, two miles. You can find all, uh, what did I catch the other day? Put in a video, I caught one of those, my first, the rat fish, those big puffers, have you caught yeah, one? Yeah, I've never caught one, I've, I've, caught seen, one. I've seen those. What did it eat? What it ate an epoxy jig. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so Rabbit fish is the name of it. They're kind of like chrome looking and like. They're like a real silver puffer. Yeah, yeah. Um, They're cool looking. Really fish. cool and fights like a, fights. Fights great for a fish that you wouldn't, but anyway. Do they blow up pretty big? Yeah, you got, you know, it's probably, it was probably like 18, 19 inches, and then you just Yeah, that's awesome. Stuff. Um, so we get some. Did you try eating them? That, that one is apparently poisonous. If you don't know how to handle it. Okay. Um, I think whatever <laughs> that's, I think there's a toxin in its liver, and I'm not going to train myself with the fish on my in front of me right, for right. the first time <laughs> like yeah yeah youtubing how to clean poisonous fish and then eating it is probably not right nice. i figured it was it was better i'm better off letting that one go uh but yeah that's one of the fish that was cool to see that and um that was on some just loose structure i literally never fished that what i found off the beach i just dropped an epoxy jig down to the bottom the rabbit fish hole it was a rabbit fish hole <laughs> um 
a lot of the loose structure this time of year will have trigger fish if you really search it out yeah. you'll have find some trigger fish you know the more time you spend on it the more trigger fish like rocks or outcroppings the trigger fish will hold to loose structure as well they're not like they don't have to be on like you know something that looks like this table it can right, be something right. real loose um you know having some nice electronics on your kayak can let you expand and you don't even have to be nice something that can just tell you something is different on the bottom um usually when i'm cruising along the beach um i always just like to if i see any lines on the bottom if i'm going slow enough i can try to capitalize on anything i'm intercepting and cruising over you know i'm not looking for little dotty stuff that could be pinfish or other bait but any sort of lines that stick out out of nowhere and there's maybe some structure nearby um in my experience if i just see lines while cruising around it's probably sharks or rays that are you know just real heavy lines um but at the same time if i see some structure and i see some lines in the area um generally that's either going to be trigger fish um, unfortunately a lot of times it's black sea bass which are typically undersized here yeah um it could be gray trout uh those lines because sometimes um, when you get your re-rendering and you see them rising off the bottom, those could be spay fish. Yeah. That's typically on something that's a little bit more uh, high relief, but that's another summer fish we have here. It's a little inconsistent. It seems like the first two years living here, I had some gray spay fish fishing, like absolutely like, you know, three to five pound fish, really nice size. The last few years, I haven't looked for them as hard, but um, those guys are around all summer. They'll eat any soft bait, clam, squid, fish bites, I've caught them on, um, yeah. like all that stuff. And uh, really great fighters, they taste pretty good. Um, and the, one of the weird things about that fish for the summer is they're the bottom fish that's not on the bottom, that's what I call them. Yeah, they're, that's they're, true. <laughs> um, they tend to transition through the water column quite frequently, they'll go up and down. Uh, very curious fish as well, but uh, very line shy. So in addition to your live well that can only keep three bogeys, your king mackerel rigs, your Spanish mackerel rigs, all your Spanish mackerel lures, you also want to be packing some rigs that you tied up the night before for spade fish. Yeah, some very light stuff. <laughs> some very light. What is the, what pound liter do you like? I usually use 15. 15 pound. A 15 pound Floor liter. Card. Yep. Um, small hook, number one's fine. Yeah. Or number two. Did they say to be hook shy at all? I don't see them find it to be hook shy yeah. at all, but they, they definitely, I noticed they don't like when I'm using a heavy weight, like when I'm trying to drop down under the kayak, I see these fish might be 10, 15 feet down. Um, if I use a one ounce sinker, that's going to be too heavy. Because a lot of times what I want to do is drop that rig down and just suspend it. And sometimes maybe it's when you're swaying, that heavier sinker kind of spooks them and turns them off. Yeah. I mean, if there's a lot of them, you'll get away with it. But like, let's say you're fishing on a school, of like maybe 10 fish. Um, you probably won't hook them. The other thing I noticed too is if I see spade, spade fish is one of those fish. A lot of times, um, how do I know if they're around? That's a good question. I always ask, like, how do you know when spade, when's yeah. a fish for spade fish alive? That's a great question. A lot of times, if it's really nice out, you'll see one on the surface here and there. They'll just kind of like cruise. It's usually when I end up catching them, is you look down and you're like, oh crap, there's spade fish right by the boat. Right. And you can look sometimes, look down, you see them. Yeah. And they also have a very distinct marking on your electronics. Oh, that's good to know. Um, that no other fish will show you. Um, if you've ever fished in freshwater and seen a school of crappie on your brush on a brush pile, that's exactly what it looks like. Really? So they have a very distinct grouping on the fish finder. And they're the only fish that will congregate and give you pretty heavy readings, you know, 10, 15 feet down consistently. If not something that just keeps cruising by, they'll probably be orienting to that area for a little bit do they usually orient to the structure pretty well like they they're going to be near higher relief kind yeah, of yeah they okay. do they're usually near higher relief um and also they'll probably um they won't like being around sharks that's what i've noticed yeah but anytime they have heavy shark activity nearby yeah, they'll kind of they'll kind of spook for the. Well, it seems like this summer that might be why we haven't caught any <laughs> because it seems like it's the summer of sharks. But no, they're a pretty cool fish. Um, and uh, yeah, you can definitely load up on them, catch quite a few of them. They're definitely one of the, the cooler summer fish that we have. They really I've never had much luck on uh, artificial lures with them. Um, but you some guys can chuck. You can really get them riled up too, and a little more aggressive. You start throwing a little bit of chum. 
some guys do like small bits of clam. Some guys use those cannonball jellies. Um, I've had mixed results with them. I just find clams to work better, honestly. I still have those packs of jellyfish that you and I bought like three years ago from the Saigon market that yeah. <laughs> we were going to try for them. Yep. And never did, but I'm still curious to see if it works. I tried eating some of it. It's disgusting. It's um, not good. It looks good. The way they have it cut, it looks yeah. pretty tasty, but it's not good. But, um, yeah, spades are cool. They're definitely one of the cooler fish. Um, they range from uh, Florida all the way through Virginia. I think they get some in Maryland. Have you ever caught any of the really big ones in, up in Virginia? The biggest ones I've caught were actually here. Were they here? How big were, did those, those go? They were like four and a half, five pounds. Like, yeah. I, those, I think the biggest one I got was about a five here. Nice. Um, oh, that's a good fish. Yeah, they, they definitely... That was. And they're narrow, so that's pretty. That's a pretty tall fish, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was, it was probably... Yeah. Like, yeah, they're cool looking. They look like angel fish. Like if you don't know what we're talking about, they almost look like an angel fish that you'd see in an aquarium a little bit. Uh, that's a good summer fish, yeah. A lot of times though, they usually range about 12, 14 inches, somewhere yeah. around there, like, you know, a pound to two pounds. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you exactly, is there a great pattern for them, but it's something that usually, as soon as that water is over 74, it's time to, you know, uh, there's a reasonable expectation that uh, okay. I shouldn't be surprised to bump into spade fish while I'm right. cruising any sort of beach structures. That shouldn't surprise me one yeah. bit. Um, trying to think. trigger fish I mentioned. Trigger fish here don't seem to congregate in heavy numbers. So in my experience, maybe I could catch like two on one spot near the beach. And then for the most part, it's, you know, you got to hunt for the next batch of trigger, you know, sure. another, another trigger. Yeah. Other places that fish, sometimes you get on schools a little. 25 near the beach oh yeah and it seems like that's more they eat pretty good too uh, uh, but the it seems like the trigger fish out like in the outer banks for example get on those near shore wrecks in far greater numbers as opposed to here it's we get the one scattered trigger fish that you know that'll show up trigger is like is like a sea bass in a way as far as its diversity of where it sits in the ocean because you'll catch them you know right up against the beach and, and you'll also catch them all the way you know 70 miles off the beach and same with sea bass. You can catch those sea bass yeah. way offshore and super, way inshore too. So um, it's kind of funny how some fish are, can, can, you know, or do live in both of those zones. Yeah, um, that's pretty, yeah, that's definitely interesting. And then... Um, what's your what's your go-to for triggers? Like if, if you're trying to target triggers near shore, as um, far as lure goes, or, or bait? Uh, triggers are attracted to scent. Yeah. Gulp works excellent for trigger fish. Um, so any tiny gulps you have, yeah. you can literally make the jankiest rig you want for them. I don't find them to be the most particularly picky yeah. or um, shy fish, unlike the spade fish. Uh, I'd say those, your, your details are more important. Um, I think trigger fish, sometimes it's finding a spot and winning the war of attrition between any, all the other little pinfish. And, right, right, right. Um, first of all, if you think there might be trigger fish on a spot, they're the least fearless to come off the bottom with the other bottom fish. So let's say you, you're dropping some, some jigs down with gulps on it and you're getting your tails bitten off. Um, the trigger fish will come up 20 feet and take the rest of the gulp without a tail. Yeah. A lot of times it's happened to me in the past. Like So if I drop a little j jig head down to the bottom and it's got a three inch gulp swimming mullet, for example, um, and it gets pounded away by a pinfish and a little sea bass. But let's say I take like two more, three more cranks up off the bottom. Um, usually if there's a trigger around, He'll probably be the one to grab it while it's way up off the bottom. Yeah. They don't seem to be afraid of coming up off the bottom to, to seal the deal. Fish bites work great for them, too. Like any of that scented stuff, it all works well. They like metal lures, too. I think the metal's kind of the attractant. Yeah. And then you can sweeten, put the hooks a little bit, either gulp or fish bite or a piece of squid. Take a little bit. And then, you know, you fish it higher up, just a little bit higher up in the midwater column. Yeah. And I think you'll have better results getting those guys to bite. Um, but... Depends where you are on the coast. You'll have great opportunities for them. Here it's a couple, and you know the more you you bounce around, they're definitely one of the more aggressive fish too. You should find those in the first batch of bottom that you're fishing. You know within that first few minutes, sure. um, versus something like the spade fish that might take a minute or two to get worked up. Um, I'm trying to think what other summer fish we get that um, are worth worth the target. Not the lizard fish, no. Um, <laughs> uh, flounder we can skip. Uh, We've yeah. done enough on the flatter, but we can talk about redfish, black drum, and sheep the ocean, said, even sheep said. ocean sheep said. Ocean sheep said's good in the summer too. Yeah. Um, at th that time of year, I prefer the shallower. 
uh, versus going into the deeper stuff versus yeah. that I might prefer in the winter, I'd say uh, the structure is 30 feet or less. Mm. Any of that real heavy structure right up on the beach is great for summertime sheep's head. Um, either rocks or any sort of wrecks, anything like that. Right. The, all of those sheep's head tend to be uh, away from that heavy blue water. I don't find them in that like yeah. tropical water, as you know, that Gulf Stream style water as much. They like a little murk to them, like a redfish or black drum. Yeah, I'd just say like a good clean inshore water is already, you know, a good starting point. Um, same deal as you know always just bringing the crabs but i think that the habitat where to find your ocean sheep's head in the summer months is definitely it's um not as deep right like all up along the beaches all those structures should have them um they might be more mixed sizes too you'll still sure. probably find your biggest ones out on that stuff i would say a lot of the biggest ones i usually catch are still out in the ocean in the summertime um but it starts to see more mixed sizes for sure yeah and those same environments you're, you're finding your sheep set are definitely going to be your prime ones for the drum too. Yeah. So uh, that's your other, you know, if, if you don't want to do the deeper silly fish, the triggers and the spade fish. <laughs> um, you can find the spade fish up on the beach too, actually. I didn't really, you know, talk about that, but the spade fish. will catch them off the piers, kids. Yeah. Oh, you did? Big mm -hmm. ones too? Yeah, good size ones. And in my head, I can't remember the exact size, but I remember looking at some of the ones we would catch and be like, God, that's big big spade fish so but what a big fish was to me back then might be different than now but yeah right up on the pier we'd i mean we'd be able to see them like you were saying with the jelly balls we'd catch the jelly balls in the landing nets and oh, yeah. cut them up and drop it down the spade fish that's cool um, yeah it's a cool summer fish i mean i should try to i'm i'm ready you know a lot of times i'd like to you know do a lot of um multitasking fishing like it would for me it's usually like the spanish mackerel in the morning then spade fish and flounder right. for the afternoon would be kind of like more mid mid to right. late morning, so they kind of glob it all together. So now it's been more like Spanish mackerel, and then probably it starts to go to the down the sheep's head route is more the what I might do for the afternoon side of it, or the drum route. For sure. As I you know no longer have the flounder as the you know the next part of the day. Right. It's right. When that mackerel bite dies out in the morning. Um, but yeah, the sheep's head should be all on the, the shallow, I would say looking shallow. I, the shallowest structures in the ocean right now is definitely the place to go for those. Same thing with the drum. Uh, you can use the same baits on the structures for those. Uh, the black drum, I don't seem to catch a whole lot of black drum on the ocean in the summertime. Yeah. That seems to be a, a definitely a less- uh, Wintertime thing. Definitely way more of a cold, cooler weather. Uh, most of the black drum that are around are up in shore for sure. That seems to be less prevalent. I'm trying to think of any other fish that pops up um, along the beaches that are on the structures. Uh, you were talking about how the sheep's head gets so shallow. I used When I used to spearfish, and I didn't, spe I wasn't like a aggressive spearfisher, but in college I would go spearfish the jetty here at Wrightsville. And more so the Masonboro jetty. Um, but man, we would, we'd start right there, you know, on the beach and walk out and start spearfishing. And the amount of sheep's head that were like in the whitewash up against yeah. the rocks and that like in the surf zone mm -hmm. was always crazy and a lot of small ones but there were still also some good ones up in that you know heavy current like impact zone of the beach um and that shallow stuff they're not afraid to get up in there yeah, um, that makes sense too though. yeah that definitely makes sense and i'd say the depth to start fishing for them with chance of success is about 10 feet yeah <laughs> i wouldn't fish for those in the shoals with a guy no definitely <laughs> that's not. definitely not efficient i think they were probably in there eating those sand fleas though that's what i always thought it's like those sand fleas getting started around by the by the white water and those sheep that are in there eating those things that makes sense it definitely makes so. sense but yeah i'd say 10 feet's your good starting zone yeah. and then i'd say probably up to about 25 is yeah. for the summer months uh, it's not that you won't catch them in the 45 plus areas it's just um, they seem to not be as heavily right. further off the beach you go. So um, if you got access to some structure real nice, real close to the beach, she says great summer thing to do, especially. Yeah. Um, you'll find some really, really nice sized ones. Um, probably have the place to yourself to do that stuff too on top of For that. Sure. So that's one of the nice little summer things too. Yeah. I always enjoy a good sheep's head bite. Yeah, they're fun to set into. Yeah, definitely. A rewarding fish to hook too. Yeah, that and... Um, what else? We, you know, we got the, the bridge stuff. Uh, you know, bridges are always good, too. They're all summer sheep's head stuff, all summer drum. Like, you know, drum will always be on all the bridges all summer. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, That's one thing I talked about. I did a Patreon video this morning just talking through, answering some questions that I had on Patreon. and um, Talking about how a lot of the 
those redfish are pulling off. They pull off to that deeper stuff this time of year. They'll still sit shallow and they'll get up shallow, but they, they like to get on those that big structure and around those where those mullet are concentrating or being funneled around something. So, yeah. Um, like a lot of fish in the waterway right now, a lot of redfish in the waterway and trout in the waterway being caught. So, um, it, are you typically just targeting drum sheep's head? I guess flounder too, but on bridges, like what? what Flounder's are great on bridges too. Yeah. Flounder's another one that's like bridges. All my biggest flounder have come, like the summer flounders, right, rather, right. have come from bridges. Yeah. Um, that was like the staple that I've always kind of been. It's like, you know, bridge fishing's awesome in the summer. Yeah. It typically just ends up being the, the hot area for a lot of fish. Um, that deeper structure, if the oxygen's good, especially if you got bridges that have, you know, great oxygen content. Which, for sure. For sure. The spots of fish in the summer. Well, uh, the other thing in the kayak too is you want to maximize your opportunities for a total amount of mileage. Yeah. And the, uh, a bridge is usually numero uno for how many opportunities you have basically almost every pilot. I'm, I'm overgeneralizing a little bit every bridge has right, right. hot sections, but um, you have the most amount of surface area for the amount of mileage you can cover to yeah, maximize your fishing opportunity. For sure. And that's kind of, that's definitely a, a big factor. And that's why it's like, it's summertime, you know, there might be one fish on the bank and it's like, right. he's tired. Uh, it's 8 a.m. He's not going to, you know, <laughs> if you're not throwing, while well, you have a, a deep structure like a bridge, you can, you know, circle and go through and do loops and have a lot of place for the, for the day. Right. That's for right. sure. Yeah. I think that's a big thing. Like, that's a question I get asked a lot. Like a question, another que- a question I answered on that Patreon this morning was, um, they were, the question was if you know if you're out in the water and he's getting skunked, like what is something that he can kind of go through, um, to to help himself break out of that cycle? And my best answer I could come up with was like put yourself in an area and just keep moving and trying different things, but but not running around. Like I feel like in a boat you get sucked into this problem of like once you start struggling you start making all these big moves instead of like I told him you know put the trolling motor down and just keep fishing through a zone. Same thing with like fishing a bridge would be like you have a lot of options, a lot of different ways you can fish it, a lot of different fish that you can target. It's so just a high produ- highly productive area. Right. So. And, and this time of year too, um, I find that the if we're talking back to the bridges, um, the drum will be on the bottom on the bridges. Yeah. A lot of times the sheep's head starts to go into the deeper stuff, but suspending. Yeah. So they'll change their habits versus being some sometimes up and real shallow like they would be a little bit earlier in late spring. Uh-huh. They might be on like some eight to fifteen foot and just kind of be anywhere in the water column. Mm-hmm. They tend to like to do this weird thing in the summertime that um, if the bridge is deep, let's say it's a thirty five foot or forty foot pit bridge, they'll start to orient in like that ten to ten to twenty foot zone, and they'll do this weird suspending thing. Yeah. So you know, you got you got to fish it now. Yeah. You, now, you're not just fishing on the bottom of this bridge, you're now fishing mid-water column. If you're in a hot zone, like the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, you've got Spanish mackerel also on these bridges now this time of year. Yeah. So you can kind of do all your bit, cover everything in these zones, uh, for sure. It's not, inshore, it's like, it's, it's the place. Is there any other fish that you see that suspends mid-water column on those bridges? Um, around us, we don't get too many Spanish mackerel on our bridges that I would say would be like a targetable, you know, pursuit. Right, right. Um, the sheep's head and the spade fish. Spade fish, yeah. Occasionally a spade fish. I have not seen many spade fish here in shore. Yeah. Um, the Virgi- uh, Virginia sees them regularly on that bridge, but over here I don't see them. Trigger fish are another one that will routinely suspend, but that's another one I don't see in shore right, here. Right, mm, Anything else besides the sheep's that I see in shore? I'm trying to think too. There's not much. Um, Maybe triple tail. Yeah, triple tail. Saw a nice triple tail in the ocean two days ago. Couldn't get him to eat. It's on a little buoy out there, and I had passed the buoy like two days in a row, and kind of got past it and looked back. I was like, oh, I should have looked and see there's triple tail in there. And I finally did stop the next day, and there was one that day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's another fish to be ready for this time of year to have a little shrimp triple, something rigged up tail. in the ocean. I've hooked them the ones I only caught one here. And it seemed like he was just floating like a leaf along. Yeah. But they, they seem to be pretty aggressive, just like um, like a trigger fish. Like, but, you know, you, for sure. You, 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 can, you can get them to eat an epoxy jig. I yeah. guarantee they'll, they'll eat a, yeah. the same thing you're throwing at a Spanish mackerel. Yeah. If you just work it properly and don't for scare sure. them when you cast it through them. For sure. Especially if they're free-floating down the ocean beach. Yeah. Uh, that, that'll definitely happen. 
Um, I'm trying to think. I think that's probably all the piling fish that you'll encounter. Yeah. No, I think that's good. I think we can end it with maybe just to like, what what do you have rigged up on a day in the summer, like in the ocean? If you if you're taking three or four rods and like you want to be ready and diverse. I try to travel with three. I think two is practical for most people too. Yeah. I say two to three is kind of how most people would settle from a kayak. Um, for the most part, one thing for casting. Yeah. Uh, with Spanish mackerel in mind. Uh, one item to troll. Uh, that can probably also double duty as casting. Yeah. And then the third thing is something for jigging, ready to go for jigging on, you know, moments notice or something live bait. Yeah. Um, but generally probably something jigging or bait oriented, something bottom oriented. Yeah. That I'm either going to jig some structure you with. You kind of cover all three yeah. water columns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of times functions. things happen quick and I just want to do like very quickly, right. um, you know, those frantic windows where the bite's hot. And then there could be that two hour lull where you don't catch anything. Yeah, for sure. So, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it seems like no matter what you do have rigged up, like you always at some point in the morning need something different. <laughs> like sitting there scrambling to try something, tie something else on. And yeah, it's, it. uh, it's funny how that works too. Yeah, and it, sometimes it's like you roll in some of the spots and you get great bites right away and then you can't catch anything after right, that. Right. And that's, yeah, it's typical, typical stuff. Yeah, I think just being flexible and, and like, ready to be make a quick change like yesterday i'm just going to share the kobe story real quick because i because i think it was one of those things where just thinking on my toes helped me catch that fish but we had a big kobe come up to the boat and uh all my bait had died my my drain on my live well stopped draining for me i think it's clogged with tiny pinfish so gotta let those kind of rot out of there but um i dropped dead bait in front of it he was kind of hanging out around the boat he didn't want it didn't want it and we reeled an oyster toad up and he got all interested in the oyster toad, and I was like, well, dang, he, he's interested in it. I'm going to try to put a big circle hook in the oyster toad and see if he'll eat it. And never thought I'd ever use oyster, an oyster toad for bait, but, I mean, he the fish wanted to eat the oyster toad. He wanted something alive. Um, so just, you know, sometimes you get those, like Elias is saying, those short windows and being ready, have, being organized, having your rods, you know, not all tangled up, laying on the floor of your boat or, you know, on your kayak knowing where all your tackle is can help you catch those fish like the big king mackerel that blows up in a pokey ball or a cobia or a redfish that shows up like it, it helps to be ready for that so i think that's an important yeah important it's easy issue. to get distracted from that yeah when you don't see a sign of anything that you wanted for a while yeah and then you, you just start tying different things that aren't right for that job or you, you had to break off and you let the rod just sit there with you know, yeah, I'm, I'm bad about that. You know, you just let it sit there with a, a little string of braid hanging through the second guide and you had nothing ready to go. <laughs> right. Those are the days. Usually I've gotten better that if I'm not doing anything, I'm not catching anything, I'll take like this mental break to reorganize everything, re-rig things. Like if there's nothing actively going on, I'm starting to get better at that, that I know that it's like, okay, let me just take this minute to re-rig everything, restructure everything reassess what the strategy will be for the rest of the day right, right so this way at least if something blows up or they're at like i might think that this window for this fish might be kind of over let me just get something going to for sure for sure i think that's important it's easy to kind of get in your head a little bit and just start like and start having nothing ready for anything right. like you're, okay. you, you came with four rods rigged up and you're fishing one and the other three had break off from sharks yeah. and you never you know, you gave up on the shark area, but now something new has presented an opportunity right. for itself and you left yourself hanging without shark. Yeah. Yeah. Don't screw yourself. Be ready. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, we're at, we're at almost an hour or so. Okay. Is there anything else that you, you feel you want to share? I mean, we've hit a lot of good information. Yes. Whenever I have you on here, it's like, golly, we, we, we've got, we need to get better at like, cause you're such a book of knowledge. Like, hyper focusing on something because you're it, it, i'm like i want a notepad when you're sitting here sharing stuff i like summer summer's fun the diversity is fun i like um summer's fun fall and winter are my two favorite stuff yeah so. yeah well fall is just around the corner um thanks guys yeah for sure man thanks for coming on guys thanks for being here if you do like this content uh we do have a patreon page with extra content my uh camera just died so i'm gonna switch over here uh, we do have a Patreon page with extra content, um, so you can go over there and subscribe to that and help out support help out supporting the channel. Um, but as always, thanks for checking out the video. We'll talk to you soon.